Hello and welcome to the next lecture in this series covering the use of focused echocardiography in the assessment of critically ill patients. In today's lecture we're going to try and tentatively approach a subject which at first glance can seem relatively straightforward. However, as I hope I'll demonstrate, it's often not as simple as it would first appear. This topic can be interchangeably referred to as filling status, volume assessment or fluid responsiveness. To my mind, these labels, whilst not identical, are all alluding towards the same question, which is a question that's important to clarify if we're going to have any hope of answering it. So, when I'm asked to perform an echo on a patient who's not my own patient, one of the most common questions I'm asked, usually within a few seconds of placing the probe on the patient's chest for the first time, is what do you think of a filling status? Now, I'm not really sure exactly how to answer that question, so I'm going to translate it into a question that I might possibly be able to answer. So when I'm asked what I think of a filling status, I suspect that more times than not, what the referrer meant to say is something along the lines of, I have reason to believe my patient's cardiac output is insufficient to meet the tissue's metabolic needs. If I increase the venous return by administering intravenous fluids, is that likely to result in an increase in cardiac output? Now it's possible this isn't the question being asked, and it's possible that the referrer is considering therapies that will decrease the circulating volume, such as diuretics or ultrafiltration via renal replacement therapy. And perhaps they want to know if the information provided by ECHO can help predict response to fluid removal. So it's essential to clarify the nature of a question being asked. But most of the time, it's this question. I'm thinking about administering fluids. Is that a good idea? There's a lot going on in this question, so before we try and answer it, we need to break it down to ensure that we understand it. Firstly, we need to agree that sometimes, but not always, administering IV fluids increases venous return, which in turn increases cardiac output, with venous return and cardiac output being the two sides of the same coin. So it's necessary at this point to revise a little cardiovascular physiology to ensure we're all on the same page. So the circulation is a circuit, and assuming there are no shunts, then all the blood ejected from the left ventricle will eventually find its way back to the right atrium. And of course the job of the heart is to keep that returning blood flowing forward, so a healthy heart will, as much as is able, move the venous return onwards. A heart that is able to move blood forward will maintain a low right atrial pressure, and if the heart can keep the right atrial pressure low, then it's not limiting venous return, and it's not limiting cardiac output. If the heart can move returning blood onward, then the body has a mechanism by which it can alter cardiac output in response to changes in demand. So by relaxing or constricting peripheral veins, the body is able to influence how much blood returns to the heart. A model we can use to help us understand these relationships and to understand the pathophysiology of certain disease states is that proposed by Guyton. So in this model we describe the venous system as containing an unstressed volume and a stressed volume. What do we mean by these terms? If we imagine we have a blood vessel that's empty and we start to fill it, the unstressed volume is the amount of blood we pour into that vessel without exerting any pressure on the vessel wall. At some point that vessel becomes full, and applying additional volume causes there to be a greater pressure within the vessel than outside it, and this additional volume is our stressed volume. By adjusting vascular tone, by dilating peripheral veins, the circulation can hold back blood within the unstressed volume, preventing it reaching the right atrium. Conversely, constricting veins will increase the stressed volume and will lead to an increase in venous return. Flow through the venous system is dependent upon the pressure gradient between the mean systemic filling pressure and the right atrial pressure, where mean systemic filling pressure is the mean pressure throughout the vasculature, from the aortic valve to the right atrium. A group in Paris have attempted to describe the mean systemic filling pressure amongst critically ill patients who have died on the intensive care unit. They measured the central venous or arterial pressure, or both, in 202 patients one minute after death. All patients had been disconnected from the mechanical ventilator following death. After one minute, all the patients who had simultaneous arterial and central venous pressure monitoring had equilibration between these two readings, suggesting that this duration of one minute was long enough for zero flow to occur. They found that the mean average MSFP was 13 millimetres of mercury. But as these figures demonstrate, there was significant variation in the values recorded ranging from low single figures up to more than 25 millimetres of mercury. It appears that for critically ill patients within the ICU, a wide range of mean systemic filling pressures are possible. Clearly for any individual, the MSFP needs to be higher than the right atrial pressure for any venous return to occur. We can plot this relationship on a graph whereby pressure is on the x-axis and flow is on the y-axis. 
This graph allows us to demonstrate that for any given mean systemic filling pressure, venous return will decrease or increase as right atrial pressure rises or falls. Let's put some example values in to see this in practice. Let's imagine that we've got an MSFP of 10 mm of mercury. So when the right atrial pressure is also 10, then there'll be zero venous return. So this is the point at which our curve intercepts the x-axis. So a much more likely uh, right atrial pressure for our healthy individual will be somewhere around about 3. Now we can see that as right atrial pressure increases, the venous return curve shows us that our venous return falls. And the reverse is true, such that a fall in right atrial pressure will result in a rise in venous return. The angle of the slope of this curve reflects resistance within the venous system. Let's imagine that our venous resistance doesn't change, but our patient's mean systemic filling pressure rises from 10 to 13. Now our venous return curve intercepts the x-axis at 13 mm of mercury, the point at which MSFP and RAP would cancel each other out and venous return would cease. The curve has the same slope because venous resistance is the same. Now for the same right atrial pressure we should expect a greater venous return. And of course the opposite is true. So if we draw a curve representing a mean static filling pressure of 7, then we get less venous return for that same right atrial pressure. If we add volume to the circulation by administering a bolus of intravenous fluid, then we are immediately adding to the stressed volume, and we're increasing the MSFP. Conversely, if we remove volume, then the MSFP will fall. How great an impact this has on venous return will be dependent on the relative change in MSFP and right atrial pressure. If we administer fluid and the right atrial pressure rises by the same amount as the mean systemic filling pressure, then we shouldn't expect any increase in venous return. Now, the heart needs a mechanism to adjust to changes in venous return. So if more blood enters the heart, then it needs to increase the stroke volume in response. And this mechanism is the Frank-Starling mechanism. The Frank-Starling law states that as ventricular end diastolic volume increases, myocytes are increasingly stretched, and they increase their force of contraction in response. And they'll do this up to a point. However, excessive stretching of the myocytes can exceed the heart's ability to increase contractility. We can plot a new graph with a surrogate for preload on the x-axis and stroke volume on the y-axis. And we can use this graph to describe the relationship between the two. Typically, when I see this graph drawn, left ventricular end diastolic volume occupies the x-axis, but of course the same relationship is taking place within the right ventricle. Now, there is no one graph that can be applied universally and there will be individual graphs for individual hearts at individual moments in time. However, a general rule is that up to a point, all hearts will increase their stroke volume in response to increased preload, and we refer to this as the steep portion of the Frank-Starling curve. Similarly, all hearts will eventually become overwhelmed, and will either have a negligible rise in stroke volume to a greater preload, or potentially, once you reach the extreme, suffer a fall in stroke volume and we refer to this as a flat portion of the curve. As with the venous return curve, the graph is not fixed. A heart can start to increase its output for a given preload, perhaps due to sympathetic stimulation. The curve moves up and to the left. Or perhaps the heart begins to fail due to intrinsic cardiac disease, and now the curve moves down and to the right. Now for a given preload, there is less cardiac output than before. If we superimpose the graph of venous return, and the graph of the Frank-Sterling curve, then we have a model that we can use to describe the relationship between mean systemic filling pressure, right atrial pressure, cardiac contractility, and cardiac output. Let's consider several disease states and use this model to try and understand the cardiovascular physiology and how being able to understand the individual patient's circulation will allow us to tailor our treatment. For our first example, let's consider a case of acute hemorrhage. Let's keep it simple and imagine that our patient has an isolated injury to a large central vein. As blood starts to leave the circulation, both the MSFP and right atrial pressure may fall, but the MSFP will fall to a greater degree. If the body made no attempt to compensate, then the venous return would fall, and obviously the cardiac output would also fall. Of course, in a healthy individual, the body will attempt to compensate. There will be a sympathetic response leading to both vasoconstriction and an increase in the rate and force of contraction in an attempt to maintain cardiac output. If the bleeding continues, then these compensatory mechanisms will become overwhelmed. Our treatment here is twofold. 
we need to restore the circulating volume by refilling the circulation with blood products. But we also need to remember to stop the bleeding. For our second example, let's consider a patient who develops a systemic inflammatory response to bacterial infection, so a sepsis model. Here there are a couple of mechanisms which will reduce the mean systemic filling pressure. There will be vasodilatation, which reduces the stressed volume. And in addition, there may be a leak of fluid out of the circulation into the tissues. If our patient is lucky, their heart will work to counter this by increasing the force and rate of contraction as required. Of course, the patient may suffer from a septic cardiomyopathy and have a concurrent decrease in myocardial performance. And clearly, this is a dreadful situation for the patient. And these patients are among the sickest that we see in critical care. For the sake of simplicity, let's imagine that the cardiac function doesn't alter during the septic episode. So we have reduced venous return due to low MSFP. Adding fluid to the circulation will increase the stress volume, but this benefit is likely to be transient, as much of that fluid will leak out into the extracellular space. So part of the management here is likely to be the introduction of vasopressors to counter the pathological vasodilatation. Of course, none of this is addressing the cause, and so in this scenario, restoring the circulation must occur alongside source control and antibiotics. For our third scenario, let's consider a patient with decompensated chronic heart failure. This patient will have pre-existing fluid accumulation, such that both their MSFP and right atrial pressure are both elevated. Even though this patient is hypotensive, giving additional fluid in this situation will produce negligible, if any, increase in cardiac output, and will come at the expense of raising venous pressures and worsening venous congestion. So, every time we're thinking about giving fluid to a patient, before we give that fluid, we should think about what sort of response we want to achieve and what sort of response we're likely to achieve. By convention, an accepted definition of fluid responsiveness is a rise in cardiac output by 10-15% to in response to a fluid challenge. The value of 10-15% to of course is a relatively arbitrary value. Certainly it might be clinically useful to elicit a smaller rise in cardiac output in response to a smaller challenge, but the problem here relates to the precision with which we can accurately estimate cardiac output. Our monitoring tools invariably have a degree of imprecision, and so if both our pre and post challenge measurements are out by a few percent, but in opposing directions, then it becomes difficult to detect small changes with adequate certainty. For this reason, most investigators use a value of between 10 and 15 percent. Many critically ill patients have central venous catheters in situ, which can provide a surrogate value for right atrial pressure, but we can now see how this information alone is inadequate to predict fluid responsiveness. A meta-analysis of 43 research papers investigating the feasibility of using CVP to predict fluid responsiveness found that the area under the receiver operating characteristic curve was just 0.56, i.e. CVP was only marginally better at predicting fluid responsiveness than flipping a coin. It's important to make as accurate a prediction as possible as to the effect of the fluid bolus, as over-resuscitation is not just ineffective, but may also be harmful. There is increasing evidence within the critical care literature of the possible detrimental effects of a consistently positive fluid balance. We now have both observational and RCT data that associates a more positive fluid balance with numerous outcome measures, including greater short-term mortality, greater length of mechanical ventilation, greater length of stay in the ICU, and greater rates of acute kidney injury. Whilst it isn't necessary to review that data in detail here, I have provided some slides that are appearing on the screen now which summarise the data from a small number of these studies. And if you're interested, then by all means pause these slides and have a read. Often, the history and clinical examination alone provide enough information to allow you to make a decision regarding fluid management. Let's consider a couple of scenarios where I feel the clinical findings strongly suggest the correct course of action. Let's imagine that you're attending a trauma call in the emergency department, and a young previously healthy man is brought in, having suffered multiple stab wounds to the abdomen and lower limbs. He's rousable only to painful stimuli, he's tachycardic and markedly hypotensive, with a non-invasive blood pressure recorded as 70 over 40. His clothing is soaked in blood. With the information already provided, have you already decided whether or not to give a fluid bolus? If I'm looking after this patient, I'm going to be administering intravenous fluids, which are going to be blood products in the first instance. I don't need any additional information from the echocardiogram, as a pretest probability that this patient requires IV fluids is already very high. This isn't to say there's no role for echo here, 
If he has upper abdominal wounds and a long blade was used, then conceivably there could be damage to the structures within the chest, and you may want to look for evidence of pericardial blood and tamponade. And if you're trained in lung ultrasound, you may use this to exclude a large pneumothorax or hemothorax. But using echo to look for evidence of hypovolemia is unnecessary, and may slow down providing a potentially life-saving intervention. Now let's consider another patient. Let's imagine you're caring for a middle-aged man on the ICU who is now well into the second week of his admission. He was admitted with bacterial pneumonia, and having been quite unwell a week ago, he's now in a weaning phase. Sedation has been reduced, allowing him to interact with staff, and ventilator settings are slowly being reduced as he gets closer to being extubated. Does he require an IV fluid bolus? Regardless of anything you might realistically be expected to see on his echo, there's nothing in the history or clinical examination to suggest his cardiac output is not meeting his tissue's metabolic needs. With respect to giving IV fluids, there is no circulatory failure that needs to be fixed. This patient has been in ICU for more than a week unless they've already suffered some new complication, then it's unlikely that they require volume resuscitation. Of course, these examples are at the extreme, and there are many patients in whom we struggle to predict their response to fluids. A repeated finding in studies that have looked at volume responsiveness in the ICU is that when clinicians administer a bolus to patients, it results in a significant increase in cardiac output only approximately half the time. Given our inadequacies, we're eternally searching for tools which improve our ability to predict. And this brings us back to the role of echocardiography, and specifically in this lecture, focused echo, in helping us answer our original question. So, if our preconditions are satisfied, we have a patient who is shocked, whose organs are inadequately perfused, and we know that giving them fluid might make the situation better, but we also know it might make it worse, and we aren't already certain whether or not to administer fluids. Then, and only then, might ECHO provide additional information which we can integrate into our history and examination to help us make that decision. Numerous echocardiographic measurements have been proposed as potentially able to help clinicians decide on a patient's likely response to IV fluids. Unfortunately, many of these measures rely on spectral Doppler and so aren't within the toolbox of a level 1 sonographer. For the purposes of this lecture, we're going to ignore those measurements and focus on a few that rely on a combination of 2D and M-mode imaging. When we discuss these different measures, we traditionally divide them into two groups labelled static and dynamic, whereby static measurements are single measurements made at a single moment in time, and dynamic measurements are changes within the circulation as loading conditions change. Let's start with some static measurements. So this paper looked at 30 patients undergoing coronary artery bypass grafting, and after induction of general anaesthesia they had progressive venisection whilst observing the heart with a transesophageal echo. The authors used a transgastric short axis view, which if you're unfamiliar with TOE is analogous to the parasternal short axis view that you will be familiar with. They estimated the patient's blood volume and sequentially drew off 1 40th of the estimated volume repeating measurements at each interval, until they collected 15% of the estimated circulating volume over a period of about 10-20 to 20 minutes. They stored the blood in citrated bags and then reinfused it towards the end of surgery. This study provides us with a nice controlled model of bleeding and we can get a sense of the changes in intracavity blood volume as bleeding progresses. The authors found that as the patient lost circulating volume they had a fall in invasively measured systemic blood pressure and surrogates of right and left atrial pressure. In these graphs, the white circles represent patients with normal LV ejection fraction and the black circles represent patients with reduced ejection fraction. The squares linked by dotted lines represent the five patients used as a control who were anaesthetized for surgery but didn't have any blood drawn off just to check that it was for removing volume that was responsible for the changes that were observed. When looking at the TOE images, they found that there was a stepwise decrease in the LV end diastolic area and the end systolic area. The fractional area change, the difference between the diastolic and systolic areas, was not significantly different, and so this decrease in preload led to a fall in stroke volume and cardiac output. And this was confirmed using a PA catheter and a thermodilution estimate of cardiac output. This study nicely demonstrates what we might imagine. It will remove blood from circulation, there is less blood to fill the heart, and the cavities become smaller. And this occurred in patients with both normal and reduced ejection fraction. What is really important to note, however, is that in the patients with poor LV systolic function, they started the experiment with larger hearts. 
they had an average LVN diastolic area of around 23 cm squared, compared to 18 cm squared in the patients with normal ejection fraction. And even after they had lost 15% of the circulating volume, the patients with reduced EF still had a greater end diastolic area than the patients with normal EF had before any blood had been removed. To me this suggests that a single measurement of LV area is of limited use if you don't know what size the patient's heart is supposed to be, i.e. you don't know what their cavity size was when they were well and uvolemic. In addition, even if changes of LV cavity size were sensitive to volume loss, this doesn't mean that they have to be specific. Perhaps other pathologists and bleeding can also produce reductions in cavity dimensions, but have different treatment strategies. So then what if we look at studies that start by measuring the heart cavities and then assess the response to a fluid challenge? There are numerous studies which have looked at exactly this, so let's consider a few of these. So in this next study, the authors took 15 ventilated patients who were in ICU with sepsis-induced hypotension, and they used TOE to measure end diastolic area in the transgastric short axis view. They indexed this to body surface area, which is a really common way we describe measurements in cavity size and echo. Next, they gave a colloid and they used 6% hydroxyethyl starch, and they gave aliquots of 500 ml, with each bolus given over 30 minutes. Boluses were repeated until they failed to produce a 15% rise in stroke volume. So they ensured that all their patients were well filled to the point of becoming non-responders, non-fluid responsive. And they did this in all patients with the exception of one patient who remained volume responsive after having received 2 litres of HESS. So the first thing to note is that in these patients fluid loading caused end diastolic area to increase. We can see that the average end diastolic area was just 9.6 square centimetres per metre square before they started, and this rose to 11.5 after the first bolus. So this is reassuring. We've seen from the last study that removing volume from circulation makes the LV cavity size decrease, and now we've seen that adding volume to the circulation makes the LV cavity get bigger. The authors then divided the measurements into those which preceded a bolus that did result in a 15% or greater rise in stroke volume, and those that didn't and the average end diastolic area was significantly smaller in the first group of measurements. These rock curves show that there was an association between end diastolic area and volume responsiveness, but in this study the relationship was only modest with an area under the curve of 0.77. This next study asked a similar question of 41 patients who were a mix of general ICU patients and patients who had undergone cardiac surgery. Once again this was a cohort of sedated and mechanically ventilated patients monitored with the combination of TOE and a pulmonary artery catheter. Patients were enrolled only if the treating clinician intended to give a fluid bolus and they were using a 500ml bolus of colloid, again a starch, and they were looking for a 20% rise in stroke volume. When they compared the 16 patients who were volume responsive with the group who weren't, they found that yes, the volume responders had statistically significant lower end diastolic areas. 15 cm squared versus 20 cm squared. And in addition, the responders' LV cavity size significantly increased response to volume, which didn't happen in the non responders. However, we can see that there was a huge overlap between the end diastolic areas measured in the responders, which ranged from 7 cm squared to 23 square centimeters, and the non responders, which ranged from 12 to 32. In this study, the area under the ROC curve was just 0.6, so based on this data we'd have to say not a helpful relationship for use in clinical practice. This next study is from a group in South Korea. They've taken 64 patients undergoing off-pump cor coronary artery bypass grafting, and they've used TOE to measure the LVN diastolic area just before starting surgery. They've used a fluid bolus of 6 mL per kilogram of ideal body weight, so for a 1.8 metre tall man that would work out around about 450 mL of HESS. They found that 40 of their patients, so 63%, responded with a rise in stroke volume of 15% or greater, and in their study there was no significant difference in the LV end diastolic area between the two groups. So an average of 21.1 cm squared in the responders and 22.5 cm squared in the non-responders almost no difference. And the area under the rock curve is just 0.6, so exactly the same as the last study, not very helpful. Another study, and this time 19 patients with septic shock. Once again, these are sedated and ventilated, and the LV area is being measured on TOE. LVN diastolic area was measured before and after a bolus of 8 mL per kilo, 6% HESS, given over 30 minutes, and they too defined volume responsiveness as a 15% or greater rise in stroke volume, 
and this occurred in 10 of their patients, so essentially half of the cohort being studied. And here we have another study where there was no significant difference in cavity size between the responders and the non-responders. So, if LVN diastolic area as a surrogate of preload is not especially helpful in predicting volume responsiveness, then what about using end systolic area? A common term that you'll find in review articles is kissing papillary muscles. That is, that the LV volume in systole becomes so low that the LV cavity is essentially obliterated and the papillary muscles crash into each other. Now, whenever I see this described in the literature, there are never any references to this term, and I don't have any original research that we can look at uh, that refers to this. However, personally, I think there is some truth in this, and it is definitely something that we do see in the most extreme cases. These TOE clips are from a young man who suffered extensive trauma to the head, chest, abdomen and all four limbs. When I was asked to come and see him he had a temperature of uh, almost 43 degrees centigrade and was hypotensive despite being on 0.8 micrograms per kilo per minute noradrenaline, so a very high dose of noradrenaline. His injuries meant that we couldn't get any good TTE windows and so here we have some TOE images. On the left, a transgastric short axis view, which is similar to the parasitic short axis view we're all familiar with. Uh, and on the right, we have a mid esophageal long axis view, which shows a very similar anatomy to what we might expect to see in the parasternal long axis window. The patient is extremely tachycardic, however, it is possible to see just how small his residual LV volume is at the end of systole. Measuring the LV cavity in the transgastric window, I made his end diastolic area 13 cm squared whilst in systole this dropped to just over 2 cm squared, which is almost nothing. So for part of his management, he needed volume. Uh, we gave him a couple of litres over the next hour, and we were able to dramatically reduce the dose of noradrenaline that he required. So this was an extreme example, and echo was definitely helpful because we could exclude tamponade, uh, and we could exclude impaired cardiac function as contributing to deterioration, which was essential. And in addition, it gave us confidence in the idea that volume resuscitation was part of the correct strategy. My personal opinion is that echo findings this dramatic are usually only seen in these extreme cases, when there's already very strong suspicion that the patient needs fluid based on the history and the physical signs. We also need to be aware that there are other pathologies which can result in low LV cavity volumes. These parasternal images are from a middle-aged man with an acute or chronic PE. Here we can see that the LV volume is dramatically reduced at both end diastole and end systole. Indeed, we have near obliteration of the LV cavity during systole. But the issue here is not hypovolemia, but that the LV cavity is being crushed by the grossly dilated right ventricle. So here's another case of a small left ventricular cavity. We've got an LV end systolic area of just 4.1 cm squared. So does this patient require intravenous fluids? So if we know a little bit more about the history and the examination, we know the answer is probably not. This gentleman's presented with acute pulmonary edema and bilateral pleural effusions. And his LV area is small in systole, not because of hypovolemia, but because he has significant left ventricular hypertrophy and has diastolic impairment with raised left atrial pressure and hence heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Another potential static measurement of preload is the calibre of the great veins which drain into the right atrium. The superior vena cava is relatively difficult to image from transthoracic windows, and even harder to measure. However, the superior portion of the IVC is usually visible from the subcostal window. If it's the stressed volume within the veins that drives venous return and hence cardiac output, then knowing the size of one of those great veins seems like it might provide us with important information about preload. Indeed, in comprehensive TTE, when assessing spontaneously ventilating patients, it's common practice to estimate the right atrial pressure based on part by the diameter of the IVC, 1-2cm to two centimeters below the RA IVC junction at end expiration. The patient should be in the supine position as turning the patient into the left lateral position can cause the IVC size to decrease. Numerous studies have assessed the relationship between IVC size and right atrial pressure, with mixed results. So in this first example, there was a positive correlation between IVC minimum diameter indexed body surface area and invasively measured right atrial pressure. However, IVC diameter did not correlate with other measures of RV or pulmonary disease, namely RV ejection fraction, invasively measured PA pressures, or pulmonary vascular resistance. 
In this next study, the investigators divided patients undergoing right heart catheterization into normal or elevated right atrial pressure, with a value of 8 mm of mercury or greater being considered elevated. They found there was a statistically significant difference in maximum IVC diameter between the two groups. However, there was such a great overlap that knowing the IVC diameter would have been of limited usefulness in predicting whether or not the patient had elevated right atrial pressure. The authors suggest a cutoff value of IVC diameter of more than 23 mm as being predictive of high right atrial pressure. Using this cutoff applied to this population, we can achieve very high specificity, but at the expense of sensitivity. Indeed, using this cutoff with these patients mean that you would miss the majority of patients with elevated right atrial pressure. If we go back to the last study and look again at that graph correlating IVC measurements against RAP, we can see that when we use the same cutoff of 8 mm of mercury, or greater as abnormal, then there is significant overlap in the IVC measurements associated with normal and high RAP measurements. Other studies typically reach the same conclusion, but in spontaneously ventilating patients, there is a positive correlation between IVC diameter and right atrial or central venous pressure. But a correlation is not clinically useful unless we can define cutoffs with a good ability to discriminate. This study from Brennan and colleagues tried to establish cutoffs by using a 50 patient strong derivation group to propose cutoff values, and then tested these cutoffs in a 52 patient validation group. Both IVC maximum and minimum diameters had a modest correlation with right atrial pressure. The authors proposed that a maximum IVC diameter of greater than 20 millimeters could be used to predict right atrial pressure of greater than 10 millimeters of mercury. When applied to a validation cohort, this was accurate 82% of the time, but had a positive predictive value of just 62%. This data is from spontaneously ventilating patients. What about patients undergoing positive pressure ventilation, who typically have a continuous positive pressure applied to the lungs, which is transmitted to the heart and intrathoracic vessels? This table details a number of studies which have looked at this correlation amongst patients undergoing mechanical ventilation. When compared with the studies which enrolled spontaneously ventilating patients, the relationship appears far weaker. These studies typically demonstrate either no correlation or a weak to moderate correlation. The notable exceptions are two studies in which patients were ventilated without positive end expiratory pressure, so patients who received positive intrathoracic pressure only during the inspiratory phase of the ventilatory cycle and not during the expiratory phase. In these two studies the correlation was much stronger and looks much more like the correlation seen in spontaneously ventilating individuals. My experience of managing critically ill patients undergoing mechanical ventilation is that PEEP is used with very few exceptions, so I think we need to conclude that using IVC diameter to estimate RAP is not that helpful in mechanically ventilated patients. Of course, even if IVC diameter correlated perfectly with right atrial pressure, We've already seen that knowing right atrial pressure is not useful in predicting volume responsiveness in critically ill patients. So it comes as no surprise to see that static measurements of IVC diameter when taken in isolation are not particularly helpful in predicting response to a fluid challenge. In this study, another by Professor Villard Baron in Paris, investigators assess the relationship between IVC diameter at end expiration and fluid responsiveness in 540 mechanically ventilated patients with acute circulatory failure. They defined a patient as being fluid responsive if they had a 10% or greater rise in LV stroke volume as derived from echo Doppler measurements one minute after a passive leg raise. So if you're not familiar with a passive leg raise, this involves starting with a patient in a semi-recumbent position, then tilting the bed so that the legs rise above the torso, which recruits blood from the venous system within the legs. This simulates increasing venous return to assess the effect this has on the circulation, but as a diagnostic test it has the advantage over actually administering IV fluids by being fully reversible, so the blood returns to the legs when the patient is repositioned back in the semi-recumbent posture. So was there a difference in IVC diameter between responders and non-responders? Yes there was. The median diameter among the responders was 18mm, whilst the median diameter amongst the non-responders was 20mm. Now, they recruited so many patients that the p-value for this difference was vanishingly small. But this graph shows you just how much overlap there was between the two groups. So, if you want to predict fluid responsiveness with a specificity of at least 95%, then you need to set your cutoff at 8mm or less. Conversely, to predict that a patient will not respond to a fluid challenge with a specificity of 
you need to set a cutoff of greater than or equal to 28 millimeters. When you set cutoffs this extreme, the sensitivity becomes abysmal. You can improve both the positive and negative predictive value of the test for predicting fluid responsiveness by raising the cutoff to 13 millimeters, but this will drop your specificity to 80%. When we apply these cutoffs to this patient group, we find that over 80% of patients are in that grey zone of uncertainty. So, unless we're faced with an extreme measurement, then IVC diameter is probably unhelpful, and the majority of the time we won't be faced with an extreme result. Whilst IVC diameter in isolation is usually unhelpful, its utility might be improved by adding in an assessment of the change in IVC diameter. To understand why the IVC can be seen to change its calibre, we need to consider the factors that influence both the pressure inside the IVC and the right atrium, and how these change over the course of a respiratory cycle. Now, we also see changes in pressure and flow across the cardiac cycle, but I suspect that trying to introduce both of these concepts, concepts simultaneously is likely to be confusing, and more importantly, not especially helpful at this juncture. And so we're going to focus just on the impact of respiration, and we'll come back to the cardiac cycle in a future lecture. Now, the IVC behaves differently depending on whether the patient is breathing spontaneously or being mechanically ventilated. So let's first consider the far more common scenario of spontaneous ventilation. So let's take a healthy individual lying supine to allow us to examine them and the heart sits enclosed within the thorax and so is affected by the negative pleural pressure which is in part due to the interplay of the elastic recoil of both the chest wall which wishes to spring open and the lungs which wish to collapse. The IVC is extra thoracic and so it's influenced by the positive intra-abdominal pressure. At rest the average pleural pressure is somewhere around negative 3 to negative 5 centimetres of water which equates to between 2 and 3.5 millimetres of mercury. When we take a breath in, the diaphragm moves down and the ribs move up and out, and this makes the pleural pressure more negative. Some of this more negative pressure is transmitted to the intrathoracic right atrium, but not to the extrathoracic IVC. So this increases the pressure gradient between the IVC and the RA, therefore increasing RA filling. Blood leaves the IVC to enter right atrium, and the IVC volume decreases, with an associated decrease in cross-sectional diameter. We can see this clearly in the subcostal IVC view. So here we have a subcostal window with the orientation marker pointing towards the healthy volunteer's head, and the IVC can be identified as it's feeding into the right atrium. So this clip was recorded during quiet tidal breathing, and we can identify different phases of a respiratory cycle by observing how the IVC collapses during inspiration and then refills during expiration. Placing an M-mode cursor through the IVC allows us to create a graph of change in calibre over time. Now ideally the cursor should have been perfectly perpendicular to the vessel walls and I haven't quite achieved that in this example, but either way it's still possible to identify the different phases of the respiratory cycle. Once again we measure the IVC 2 cm below the RA IVC junction, and in this example we have a maximum diameter of 24mm measured at end expiration, and a minimum diameter of 22mm measured during inspiration. We can calculate the collapsibility index by using the formula IVC maximum diameter minus minimum diameter divided by the maximum diameter and multiplied by 100. So here we have a collapse of 2 millimeters over a maximum diameter of 24 millimeters which means we've observed an 8% collapse. In patients receiving mechanical ventilation and making no respiratory effort an air entered the lungs not because of pleural pressure decrease, but because of an external pressure generated in the ventilator, which pushes air into the chest. Here, the intrathoracic right atrium is exposed to an increase in pressure, and the pressure gradient between the RA and the IVC decreases. So RA filling also decreases, and the IVC distends, as it's no longer able to send quite as much blood to the heart. So here we have two traces taken from central venous catheters, and on the left is a trace taken from a patient who's spontaneously ventilating. And we can see there's a sharp fall in the mean CVP when the patient takes a breath in. And then to contrast this, on the right hand side we've got a CVP trace taken from a patient who's mechanically ventilated, and here we can see during the inspiratory phase of positive pressure ventilation the CVP rises. So we should expect to see the IVC collapse a little bit, when a patient takes a breath in. And likewise, we shouldn't be surprised to see a small amount of distension on patients receiving positive pressure ventilation.
There are a number of factors that influence the degree to which the IVC changes its calibre over the course of a respiratory cycle, but to help us understand why IVC variability might be of use in assessing the patient's volume status, we're going to consider a simple model which considers just two factors, the central venous pressure and the magnitude of change in the intrathoracic pressures and volumes during respiration. Let's start with our spontaneously ventilating patient. Let's imagine they are euvolemic and they're breathing normally. With each inspiration the pleural pressure falls, let's say from minus 3 cm of water to minus 8 cm of water. And this in turn causes the RA pressure to fall and the CVP to fall and the IVC diameter decreases, the IVC collapses. Now if our patient then becomes hypovolemic, say they suffer some trauma and acutely lose circulating volume, then if everything else about their physiology remained the same, then the RA pressure and the CVP would fall. The IVC calibre would decrease and for the same change in pleural pressure, we might see an exaggerated degree of collapse. In this scenario, the fall in CVP, which occurs during respiration, is great compared to the mean CVP. Now let's imagine that we re-examine our same patient 24 hours later, having aggressively resuscitated them. So we've stopped the bleeding, and we've administered a variety of blood and products and crystalloids, and now they have a positive fluid balance in the double figures and a CVP to match. Now the same quiet breathing produces a relatively modest pressure change as a proportion of the CVP. But in these examples we're only adjusting one side of the equation. What if we take a euvolemic patient but now they have an increased work of breathing? Perhaps they've ingested a toxin which has resulted in a metabolic acidosis and they're trying to blow off CO2 to compensate for this. In this example the CVP is normal, but their work of breathing has increased and they're generating greater changes in intrastic pressures and great tidal volumes and this in turn is going to invoke a greater degree of IVC collapse. So this is a key point to remember. If you're going to look at IVC collapsibility in spontaneously ventilating patients, you need to factor into your interpretation the patient's work of breathing. If a patient is working hard, then you should anticipate seeing a greater degree of collapse. And of course, this same relationship is also important for patients receiving pure positive pressure ventilation. So when we're considering how much the IVC distends during inspiration, we need to know and consider the tidal volume which the patient is receiving. Regardless of the patient's volume status, we'd expect that a small tidal volume would produce a smaller degree of distension than a large tidal volume. OK, so that's the theory behind why the IVC changes its diameter across the respiratory cycle. But does that translate into being able to use the IVC variability to predict response to a fluid challenge? There are a vast number of studies that have tried to look at exactly this question, and as you could probably imagine, the results are mixed. Let's start by looking at a recent meta-analysis by Orso and colleagues, which identified 26 studies which tried to answer this question. Now, these studies are not homogeneous, and so perhaps it's not surprising that we're going to see different results between the different studies. So first of all, we can see that these studies are looking at different patient groups. The patients have different pathologies, so we have some which take all comers very early in their presentation in the emergency department, some restricted septic patients or patients who've undergone cardiac surgery who are now in the ICU, to some very specific patient groups such as women with preeclampsia in the operating theatre. So these groups are likely to have different pre-test probabilities for being fluid responsive, and so that makes any test performed differently. Beyond that, the IVC assessment isn't performed the same way in each study. Different studies looked for different levels of collapse or distension. So let's first consider those studies which include patients who are spontaneously ventilating. In these studies, the degree of IVC collapse the authors were looking for ranges from 25% up to 64%. Most of the textbooks and review articles I've seen quote a value of 50%, which was actually only used in two of these studies, but is an easy value to remember. Then if we look at the studies which have recruited patients receiving mechanical ventilation, well, this tends to produce a smaller degree of variation across the respiratory cycle. In the studies included in the analysis, the degree of distension considered significant varied from 10% to 46%. There is certainly no one universally agreed value for a significant degree of distension, and different textbooks and review articles quote different values, but these tend to cluster around the 15% mark. Next, if we look at the patients being mechanically ventilated, it isn't always reported how they're being ventilated. We've just stated that one of the biggest factors that will influence the magnitude of the IVC variability is the change in intrathoracic pressure and volume. Well, this isn't always reported, but when it is, we can see that most studies are using tidal volumes between 8 and 10 mils per kilo, presumably of ideal body weight. So if you want to apply these results to your mechanically ventilated patient, then you need to check how is your patient being ventilated. 
and more than 8 mils per kilo is actually pretty high for modern ICU practice. And so if you're ventilating your patient with less than 8 mils per kilo, you're more likely to get a negative result. So that is, you're more likely to get distension less than the cutoff threshold. And of course, this problem is even greater for spontaneously ventilated patients, because not only there will be different work of breathing and tidal volumes between different patients, but these factors will vary within the same patient, breath to breath, whilst you're performing your study. Not only that, but they're much more difficult to measure for practical reasons, and effectively, we never measure these in real-world clinical practice. In addition to that, the volume of the administered fluid both varies, and the size and rise in cardiac output, which is considered significant, also varies. In one study, 200 mils was administered, looking for a 10% rise in cardiac output, while several others were looking for that same 10% rise, but were giving half a litre to achieve it. Many studies wanted a 15% rise in cardiac output to define a positive volume response, whilst one wanted 16%. This heterogeneity between studies is a really common issue faced by meta-analyses, and it's important to recognise it when we're trying to interpret results. So how well did IVC variation do in predicting fluid responsiveness? So the pooled sensitivity was 0.72 and the pooled specificity was 0.75. So for the rock curve, we have an area under the curve of 0.71. So that's better than just knowing the central venous pressure, but that's a pretty low bar. Interestingly, in this meta-analysis, the authors found that the test for collapsibility in spontaneously ventilating patients performed slightly better than the test for distension in mechanically ventilated patients. And this is at odds with some of the other meta-analyses. In this review by Long from a few years ago, they found that IVC variability was a better predictor of fluid responsiveness in mechanically ventilated patients, with an area under the curve of 0.79 compared to 0.76 in spontaneously breathing patients. If we look at this table, we can see that the pooled sensitivity among spontaneously breathing patients was just 0.52, i.e., if you use a lack of collapsibility to describe a patient as not expected to respond to a fluid challenge, then you'll withhold fluids from almost half of the patients who would benefit. Now, if you want to use the IVC to help you assess a patient's volume of status, there are some significant limitations that you have to be aware of. The first of these seems so obvious that it sounds half saying it, but first of all, you need to make sure you have the right vessel. When individuals first start performing focused echo, it's not uncommon to think that you're looking at the IVC when, in, in truth, you're looking at the aorta. They both run vertically, close to the midline, and between the chest and the abdomen. Whilst there are a number of clues as to which vessel is which, the best way to ensure you're looking at the IVC is to make sure you can clearly see where it enters the right atrium. From the subcostal window, if you accidentally find the aorta, then as you follow it cranially up into the chest, then it should run behind the left ventricle. The normal anatomical relationship between the two is that they run parallel, but that the IVC runs towards the patient's right. If you do find you're imaging the aorta and you want the IVC, then all you need to do is tilt the tail of the probe towards the patient's left a few degrees, so that the imaging sector moves to the patient's right. Another mistake that's easy to make when you're first starting out is mistaking the right hepatic vein for the IVC. As you rotate the probe anti-clockwise from the subcostal forward chamber view towards the IVC long axis view, you'll pass by the right hepatic vein, once you've rotated the probe around halfway, so around 45 degrees. In this clip I've intentionally rotated a probe and then stopped halfway to highlight the position of the right hepatic vein. It too can be seen to drain into the right atrium, because of course it does, so it's easy to see how this mistake can be made. Once you've correctly identified the IVC, it's essential that you rotate the probe to provide a true long axis, then tilt the probe to ensure you're maximising the size of the IVC. If the imaging sector isn't through the centre of the vessel, then you'll underestimate the vessel size and you'll overestimate the change in calibre with respiration so you're likely to incorrectly mislabel the patient as volume responsive. This animation also demonstrates another difficulty you can experience when trying to measure the IVC at different points in time. As a patient breathes, your IVC can move whilst your imaging sector holds position. This is difficult to rectify when it's occurring, but it can sometimes be improved by sliding a probe slightly to one side. If you can't make this issue go away, then at the very least you need to be able to recognise when it's occurring so that you know to take the measurements with a pinch of salt. The next limitation is that so far we have discussed the two scenarios of spontaneous negative pressure ventilation and full positive pressure mechanical ventilation, and described how in these scenarios we have a predictable direction of change in intrathoracic pressure that we can utilise to look for IVC collapse or distension. But we haven't considered the large number of patients within the ICU receiving either invasive or non-invasive assistive ventilation, 
So patients who are not receiving neuromuscular blocking drugs, who are not deeply sedated, and are making some respiratory efforts, so generating some negative intrathoracic pressure, which then triggers a ventilator into applying some additional positive pressure. These patients have an increase in intrathoracic volume, but with an unpredictable change in intrathoracic pressure. When you scan these patients, you will sometimes see the IVC collapse and others distend, reflecting whether it's the patient's own work of breathing which dominates, or if the majority of the work is being done by the ventilator. This group of patients hasn't been studied in the way that the other two groups have, but if we just consider what we might expect from our understanding of the physiology, we would expect that the positive pressure from the ventilator would conceivably fully or partially negate the, the negative pressure generated by the patient. We would expect to see exactly what we do see, which is that sometimes the IVC collapses, sometimes it distends, often it does nothing. And without knowing the change in pleural pressure, which we never routinely measure, it's impossible to interpret. How big an issue is this? Well, as I recall the audio for this lecture, I carried out a quick spot audit of the patients currently admitted to critical care at King's College, where I work. So right now we have 81 patients admitted to ICU. Of these, 20 are breathing spontaneously, eight are receiving some form of non-invasive ventilation, 38 are ventilated in an assisted mode via an ET tube or a trachea, so a mode like pressure support or SIMV, and only 15 are on a mandatory mode of ventilation. Even if we assume that all 15 of those patients are deeply sedated and making no respiratory effort whatsoever, that means that we can only look for IVC distensibility in 28% of our mechanically ventilated patients. Modern ICU practice involves using low doses of sedation and keeping the patient as awake as possible whenever their condition allows it. And in these patients, you just can't use IVC variability to predict fluid responsiveness. Next limitation, and we need to consider all of the situations whereby the pathology or the treatment raises right atrial pressure. The assumption behind using the IVC to guide decision making with regard to volume responsiveness is that elevated central venous pressure is due to relative hypervolemia that there is too much circulating volume. But of course there are plenty of other reasons why the CVP will rise. These can be cardiac pathologies such as acute or chronic RV failure, cardiac tamponade due to pericardial effusions, obstructing lung pathologies such as COPD and asthma where the patient generates autopeep, or perhaps it's iatrogenic because we're using high levels of peep to treat the patient. All of these situations might result in a dilated IVC that erroneously leads a sonographer to conclude that the patient cannot require further fluid resuscitation. Another scenario we need to be wary of is when the patient's chest is not a sealed space. It might be they've had a thoracotomy and the chest remains open, but this is relatively rare, and when it does happen you usually struggle to get good transthoracic windows. But what about the more common scenario whereby the patient has either unilateral or bilateral chest drains? Now when the patient takes a breath in or receives a mandatory breath from the ventilator, some of that pressure change will be transmitted into the drain. To the best of my knowledge, this technique hasn't been robustly tested to look for the impact of chest drains on IVC size and variability, and certainly if your patient has a chest drain, you shouldn't be using the IVC to guide volume resuscitation. Next, let's consider that the IVC size at any moment is not just determined by the central venous pressure, but rather the relationship between the central venous pressure distending the vessel and the intra-abdominal pressure which is pressing on the outside of the vessel walls. This study by Professor Lyard Maron, which we touched on earlier in this lecture, looked at the utility of IVC size to predict volume responsiveness, comparing patients with normal and elevated intra-abdominal pressure. They transduced the urinary bladder as a surrogate for intra-abdominal pressure, and they used a value of 12 mm of mercury as their cutoff for elevated. In patients without intra-abdominal hypertension, there was a weak but present correlation between IVC size and right atrial pressure, but this relationship was absent in the patients with high IAP. In this cohort of patients, 30% had high IAP, and the relationship between IVC maximum end expiratory diameter and fluid responsiveness was much weaker in this group. This table nicely summarises some of the limitations we've just discussed. So, with so many limitations, is it even worth imaging the IVC? So my own practice is that I always do try to look at the IVC and I consider its size and its variation size over a respiratory cycle. But I do this as part of my global assessment of circulation rather than looking for a quick and easy test to detect whether I do or don't give fluids. And I advise my trainees to do the same. So I dissuade them from making statements like we should give fluids because the IVC is small and collapsing, without stopping to think if any of these limitations apply to their patient, and without integrating that single component of the ECHO assessment into their global assessment. How useful you find the IVC assessment might well be influenced by the patient cohort you're scanning.
So personally, I don't do any pre-hospital work. I sometimes scan in the emergency department or referrals of a ward, but most frequently it's in the ICU. It's ICU patients I'm scanning. My patients tend to be older and have comorbidities, including cardiac and respiratory disease. They tend to be mechanically ventilated, but in an assisted mode. So for me personally, and the cohort of patients that I scan, the IVC rarely tells me anything I don't already know about the patient's volume status. So let's finish by returning to the question which was posed to us at the beginning of this lecture. We pick up a probe and begin to scan a patient, and as we do, someone asks us, what do you think of the filling status? How are we going to answer that question? First, we need to clarify what they're really asking. Are they really asking us, should I administer additional fluids? Assuming that this is the case, then we need to ask, is the patient in circulatory failure? If it's not, it's easy, they don't need a fluid bolus. If they are, then what do the history and examination tell us? What do we think is the pathophysiological mechanism behind the patient's shock? Of course, the focused echo forms part of our physical examination and may provide us clues as to the nature of the patient's illness. Understanding the pathophysiology of this individual patient's shock state is essential if you're going to try and reverse it, and this information will form the basis of your pre-test probability, i.e. how likely is it that fluids will improve the situation before you add in your echo findings. If it's obvious before you start that the patient needs IV fluids, then don't delay until you finish your scan. Indeed, you don't necessarily have to perform a scan if the nature of the shock is unambiguous. Within the limitations of 2D focused echo, there are only a few assessments you can make which might guide you. You can look at the size of the LV in both diastole and systole. Given the large range of normal values seen in the normal population, even when limited to only healthy individuals, Diastolic size is probably only really helpful if you have a baseline for that patient and know what their cavity looked like previously. A very small cavity in systole, so one where you see kissing of the papillary muscles, well that supports the idea that the patient will benefit from IV fluids, but be careful to ensure that this appearance isn't due to RV dilatation or marked LVH. You should always try to visualise the IVC and consider both its maximum and minimum diameters and degree of variability but you need to consider how the patient is breathing, so pure negative or positive pressure, or a mixture of the two, and you need to consider all of the limitations we've just covered before drawing any inference from it. On the face of it, deciding whether or not to give a patient a fluid bolus feels like it should be a really straightforward decision, and sometimes it is, but often it isn't. And it's because of this challenge it's so appealing to try and come up with a simple, quick, reliable prediction tool to guide decision making. Unfortunately, the dramatic echo findings are usually reserved for patients with the most obvious clinical signs, so for the patients in whom the answer was already obvious. In the patients where you need clarity, the echo findings are frequently equivocal, and as you learn to perform and report focused echoes, you'll need to get used to saying, I'm sorry, but I can't answer that question.